much earlier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good speech. Ian McKelvey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, it's a, uh, a pleasure to take a call on the Anti-Money uh, Laundering and Countering Financing of Terrorism Amendment Act, or Bill, uh, second reading. And, and uh, Mr. Speaker, the, the select committee stage of this bill was very interesting in, the, in that we all, uh, I guess, concurred on the eventual outcome of it, was how we got there that was very interesting. And, and the thing that uh, interested me most, I guess, was the, was the different um, questions that were asked by different members of that select committee. And one who was particularly uh, active in the course of that um, uh, select committee process was uh, Barry Coates. He spent a lot of time uh, uh, raising issues that were quite pertinent, as it turned out, mm -hmm. to the course of the, of the select committee process. So, so, Mr Speaker, the select committee process for me was an interesting one. It was uh, uh, quite a long one, actually. And our chairman, uh, Carmel uh, Buck uh, Bakshi, did a great job of chairing that committee and taking those submissions um, through their process. But I want to talk about a couple of submissions in, in, uh, specifically, uh, Mr Speaker, and one of them is the uh, submission from the racing industry. So, so if you think about money laundering, it's one of the oldest crimes known to man, or woman for that matter, and, uh, and the racing industry throughout its history has been, I guess, one of the places that was a very easy place to, money, uh, to launder money, uh, and that it was one of the earliest forms of gambling we had in this country, and, and one of the uh, earliest forms of bookmaking we had in this country. So there was two forms of, of gambling took place in the racing industry, the legitimate one and the illegitimate one. Um, the legitimate one is easy to track, the illegitimate one's almost impossible to track. But nonetheless, the thing that interests me most about the racing industry was that you or I, or any, well, sorry, Mr. Speaker, uh, anyone in this house could go along and put a small bet on a racehorse, and they could come away with a with a return in excess of ten thousand dollars. If they did that, and you could do, you could actually do it if you think about it. If you are fortunate enough for five dollars, you could put a five dollar bet on a racehorse, come out with ten thousand dollar with a ten thousand dollar dividend. In the event of that, you would end up uh, being subject to this Act. And so you would then be part of the disclosure scheme and you would forever be uh, part of the records or the history of this country. And I guess that that's one of the things that concerned me most was that from a racing industry perspective, it picked up people when they were paid out as well as when they paid in. So if you put $10,000 on a horse, for example, you expect to be picked up in the course of this Act. If you put $5 on it and took $10,000 out, you wouldn't necessarily expect to be. And I think that was, a, that was an interesting issue for me. The other thing that this submission, that, that in the course of this submission was raised, was that was the amount of time that, that, that was, or they were allocated or allowed to comply with this bill. And that was very challenging for that industry, because you think about their technology, that the only way you can monitor those bets, and there's a large number of them, is through their technology system. And they've got, they need time to bring that technology up to date and to be able to get it to comply. So they were concerned about that. And the fortunate thing about um, their situation, I think a number of other situations, is that the Minister does have the ability to grant exemptions around the time scale of this thing. And that he, also, or he or she also has the, the ability to grant exemptions around other bits of this Act too. And I don't think for a minute we should be giving exemptions out too freely, but I do think it's necessary and or will be necessary in the course of the implementation of this Act for some exemptions to be made to enable uh, organisations and, um, and businesses to comply, because it is a very complicated thing. So I want to get on to another submission now, which I thought was really uh, equally as interesting, actually, and that was Farmlands, who, who are a large farmer cooperative, who made a, quite a compelling submission, although an, a, a little bit of it was, a, a bit of that submission was outside of, this, of, the, of the context of the bill, but their submission was based around the uh, customer due diligence and the fact that their shareholders, because they're owners of the company, were, were part of uh, or became part of the compliance of this bill. They were very concerned about that. And if you think about the conservative old uh, uh, a person who might be a member of Farmlands, they're not that keen on having themselves exposed to some kind of, uh, no. uh, I guess, act which may well uh, implement or, or eventually um, involve them in some kind of uh, well, perceived criminal activity. And so I think that, that was an interesting submission. The, the select committee got through that, and in fact, it, it again isn't altogether relevant to the bill. But it was 
um, an interesting submission that they made, and it was also, I think, um, has the potential to be part of any exemption that might be granted in the future. There were a number of other submissions that were very interesting, uh, including one from an accountant in, uh, in South Auckland who at length uh, explained a whole lot of alternatives to the bill. Or, from Puka Curry, exactly, Tony. Yeah, one of yours, I think. Um, he must have been one of Bailey's. He was very complicated. And, <laughs> and um, he made a number of submissions around the, around the fact that he thought there were alternatives to this that could very easily short-circuit the system and save the country a lot of money, or save the accountant a lot of money, I think. But um, that was also ruled out. And, and a lot of the submissions we heard, um, Mr Speaker, remind me very much of a film called The Sting. And for those of you who have seen this thing, I thought it was an amazing film. Um, it was one of the most exciting ones I've ever seen, really. But, but it is a little bit what this is all about. And whilst I realise the serious side of this, and, the, and the, um, as the previous speakers, or the previous two speakers pointed out, there's a lot of challenges around how, our interna or how we're perceived internationally and the fact that, that if we enable people to effectively launder money in any way through this country, it's, um, it's not in our best interest or in the country's best interest. But nonetheless, it sort of does kind of, uh, it brings sort of connotations of these kind of things like this thing to me. And I think that uh, whilst I realise the seriousness of it, it is a bit interesting. So the bill really is designed to halt criminal activity in every way. And we had a lot of discussion around the, the alternative forms of criminal activity. And it, and it, amazingly to me, involved everything from buying artwork. Uh, for half the price of what it was worth and, and moving it on. Uh, you can get involved in anything like that, which I was su quite surprised at, actually, at some of the lengths people go to launder money. And the other, the other thing that was apparent through the course of this bill was the fact that the police have a financial intelligence um, uh, branch, which then, uh, I guess, their role is to investigate all of this sort of stuff and pick up the issues that create the most... Um, difficult challenges for them. Uh, it was interesting to think of some of the ways they might uh, look at this, and uh, Mr Speaker, it was a, was a very challenging situation for the police. And obviously this money laundering, it allows criminals to fund their lifestyle. It's very difficult for them to, um, I think, um, uh, get away with a lot of these things, but nonetheless, this bill will bring it into line. Say, Mr Speaker, I think the bill strikes a balance between combating crime, minimising the cost of compliance and meeting international obligations. And while I do think there are some onerous, um, initially some onerous obligations put on things like the racing industry, and you could argue even on our accountants and lawyers, I think on the whole it, it enables us as a country to meet our international obligations, to get on top of, that's fortunate, to get on top of the, the uh, to get on top of, um, of the potential for crime and the potential for our international reputation to be damaged. So, Mr Speaker, I think we've done a pretty good job in a select committee. I think the Chairman's done an outstanding job of chairing that select committee and getting to this point, and I look forward to the discussion as it moves on through the House in the next uh, uh, two stages. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Kia ora. Pini Hinari. Tēnā Mr Speaker. First Tēnā of all, can I confirm our support for